Good morning, everybody. And uh, I think like many in the room, I'm uh, still in shock over uh, game two of the World Series. So uh, I'm kind of riding that high. Um, hopefully it continues on Friday. Um, but I, first, I want to begin by thanking the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations, uh, particularly Dr. Anthony and, and Pat Mancino and the, and the team, uh, not only for their congratulations on their 28th annual uh, Policymakers Conference, uh, but inviting the U.S. Chamber to be a part of this. And uh, certainly want to welcome our distinguished uh, panel and appreciate them taking that time out of what I know are busy days to be here with us. Uh, in teeing up our panel, as Dr. Anthony mentioned, business investment and developmental dynamics in Arabia and the Gulf. I just wanted to um, very briefly mention at the U.S. Chamber, um, we represent the interest of about 3 million American companies of every size and sector. Uh, but interestingly, while we're known in this town oftentimes for what we do on the domestic agenda uh, with Capitol Hill and whomever's in the White House, uh, the fact is the international division of the U.S. Chamber is actually the biggest part of the chamber. And the Middle East uh, division within international is actually the biggest in terms of corporate engagement. And that largely reflects uh, the interest of where we see U.S. businesses going, um, oft oftentimes also where the challenges are. Uh, we uh, like to engage vigorously uh, when there are those challenges. And I know we were asked to make some policy recommendations. And I, and I do have to say, Dr. Anthony, we love that. We always come in hand um, with a lot of policy recommendations. And I want to mention, as we look at uh, the, the Gulf countries and Saudi Arabia in particular, you know, we from the chamber completely understand and appreciate the vision, uh, Vision 2030, and all the different vision plans, the attempt to move toward economic diversification, uh, grow um, non-oil revenues and GDP. And we know that to do so, to have a more innovation-based economy, uh, there are some really particular uh, policy recommendations that we would like to uh, share and that we do regularly share with those in uh, key positions in government. So I'm not going to go into everything, but I do want to say I know the last panel talked about IPO um, at the chamber. While we're certainly interested in that, we're very interested in IPR, intellectual property rights. If you're going to have um, a robust, uh, innovative economy and an ecosystem that encourages research and development and attracts that type of foreign investment and those innovative economies, be they in life science, be they in digital, uh, be they in renewable energy, you have to have a robust intellectual property regime uh, that protects that. Um, and we would encourage all the countries, uh, not only in GCC, but across the Middle East, uh, to work toward more robust intellectual property regimes and to protect, protect those intellectual property rights. We have a whole litany of other uh, recommendations that I will share for the record, as they say, on uh, digital economy, on autonomous vehicles, on artificial intelligence, uh, all of these very exciting new spaces uh, as those countries work toward economic diversification. Um, we're very excited to have a, a, a great panel with us. We have two speakers, and, a, and, a, and, and Dr. Gaeth, I think you'll provide some comments and reaction after we hear from our two speakers. Uh, but first up, I think everybody has in their, in their programs their biographies, so I'm not going to do an elaborate introduction, uh, but I would first like to welcome up uh, Dr. Mac McClellan um, to hear from him, and then we'll move uh, to our next speaker after that. But please join me in welcoming Mac. Thank you. <clears throat> so for those of you who happen to know my wife, she's Syrian. And an Emirati friend of mine uh, said one time, so you're married to a Syrian woman? I said, yes, I am. He, hmm. I said, yeah, she's from Aleppo. He said, yeah, you wanted a challenge in your life, didn't you? <laughs> so of course, being the good husband, I turned to her when I was asked to speak. And I said, what do you think I should speak about? She said, speak about two minutes and sit down. <laughs> if I go over, please don't tell her, please. So as I looked at this, though, the, the title Business, Investment, and Developmental Dynamics in, the, in Arabia and the Gulf, it took me back to April 4th, 1968. Significant for, four, for three reasons. First, it was my 12th birthday. Second, uh, we learned that Martin Luther King had been assassinated and being 12 years old and having spent half of my life abroad, I didn't even know who he was, just that it was making all of the front pages of the newspapers. And third, we were standing in Rome Airport. We were supposed to fly to 
Port Harcourt, Nigeria, for my dad's um, uh, energy uh, or oil services firm. And he was going to open the office there, and we were going to live in, in Port Harcourt for the next several years after having done the same thing in, in Germany and Austria. And we got word when we tried to check in for the flight that the Civil War had broken out in Nigeria, and the flights were all canceled. We couldn't go to Nigeria, and they didn't know how long it was going to last. So my dad sent a telegram back to the company headquarters. Remember, this is 1968. Sent a telegram to Houston to the uh, home office of Weatherford, which at the time was a family-owned business, now a conglomerate, and, and asked uh, what they thought he should do. As we were standing there in the airport, and the little louvers were turning, showing you uh, where the flights were going, what time, what gate, etc., he looked up and he said, Tripoli, I think Occidental Petroleum is doing something there. And so in his telegram, he said, what about if we go to Tripoli instead of to Port Harcourt? And the next day, the telegram came back saying, yes, go ahead. They wired money. Dad went down and bought the tickets. And on April 6th, we flew to Tripoli. No contacts, no local partner, nothing. Just the, the wildcatter energy mentality that existed at the time where you went and made it up as you, as you went. And, and again, as I was looking at the subject of this, the last 40 years, 50 years since then, that Libya could have been something much more than it is today. It could have easily outdone the Dubais of the world in the development of the infrastructure. It could have rivaled uh, Beirut and Lebanon in its culture and history and, and all the things that that these cities and countries are, are known for. And yet, within 12 months after arriving, Mr. Gaddafi took over, and it made life very difficult for us. My parents had the prescience to put us in a local Libyan school, and I did that for four and a half years before we finally left as it got more difficult for Americans in Libya. But if you think about Libya as a case study for business, envelopment, uh, intra, uh, investment and developmental dynamics, it's one of the basket cases. And we should use Libya as a case study to learn what not to do and, and how we can do things differently in the Middle East, in Arabia, to have more success stories. And so my comments when, uh, when we get to the question and answer, I'll talk about some investment opportunities, the business environment, and in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, in Saudi Arabia, and other places. Let me just say that uh, when uh, John Pratt asked me to, to come speak and I got the inv invitation from Dr. Anthony, it took me back again, little history lesson, back to August, uh, mid-August mid of 1990. Iraq had just invaded Kuwait, and the Commandant of the Marine Corps, at the time General Gray, who I worked for, asked me to go speak to a group of journalists, congresspeople, and, and others. And I got there, and they said, and the, the other speaker is Dr. John Duke Anthony. Well, I had spent the entire weekend rereading a lot of the publications that uh, Dr. Anthony had done. And, and so I was prepared. I had, I had condensed it to one page, and I was ready to go. And they asked Dr. Anthony to speak first. He did. I just slowly checked everything off of my one page, and then they said, Mac, what do you think? Yeah, I think Dr. Anthony summarized it very well. Thank you. <laughs> Mac, thank you for that. Uh, that uh, nice summary. Um, I'd next like to invite up to the podium uh, Dr. Turkey Faisal Rashid. Uh, and I know he's got a presentation, and we'll turn the podium over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Which one goes? This one. This is okay. This is there. Uh, one time, there was a lady sitting in the front, and her husband was giving a speech. And every time she goes like this, 
and she sent them a kiss. And then after the conversation or after his speech, everybody went to the lady. She said, wow, you love your husband so much. I said, no, I have a signal with him. Every time he go off, I tell him, keep it simple, stupid. So <laughs> please, if I am out of line, send me some kisses and I will know what it is. OK, my topic is uh, it's quite simple. Is, uh, I honestly believe the most important things for any government is to provide food, to provide a bed, a house, and to provide a job, and then to provide a bed also in case you get sick. Uh, you could see here my uh, topic is economic diversifications in the GCC. I'll go quite, uh, I'll go quite fast. A problem is well stated is a problem have solved. If you know the problem, that's already your halfway through. Uh, the transformation plan in the Gulf state is how is the public government play a major role in the diversification on the GCC. The development of the government is the involvement of the governments. What is the main questions here? Is will the government of the GCC better manage different transformation? How do they do that? By strategic thinking, by long-term strategy, and their strategic capabilities. These are the political uh, institutions of the GCC, which is, I'm sure, most of you knows about it. Arab Spring 2011. A lot of people are asking why, what did happen. We think it's derailed the GCC government from their strategic capabilities. And Bahrain was the most effective, most affected uh, country out of the uh, Arab Spring. Why did it happen? Many people, including myself, believe the poverty, lack of particip participations of the civil societies. What are the challenges facing the Gulf state? It's empowerment of women, and I mean real empowerment of women, not uh, cosmetics uh, changes, public finance, security challenge, government challenge, and economic challenges. When you want, if you cannot measure it, it doesn't exist. And you need to measure the government performance. I use those six uh, index of measurement. And as you could see on the voice and the accountability, Saudi Arabia, it went up from 3.4 to 5.9. Kuwait, it went up from 2.28 uh, to 30. Uh, the political stabilities, uh, Kuwait went up, and same as uh, Saudi Arabia. So these are the index which is I depend on measuring the performance of the uh, government. And these are those uh, index. I'm not going to read it for you. I'm sure you could read a lot better than I am. <laughs> to summarize what I want to say here is the challenge being oil uh, economy. The leaders, they understand how volatile it is. Uh, it gives a false uh, oil income or rent a state or natural resources, it gives a false feeling of confidence. And sometimes it gives the illusions of power. You really think you are very powerful. In reality, you are not. Uh, they know they, could, they have to diversify their economy. This is what's been going on for 20, 30, 40 years of all the GCC. But let's look really of what's happening. Are they really diversifying their economy? or not. 
If we look at the data here, uh, percentage of oil rent of the GDP, you could see in Bahrain, it's actually went down. If you look at Kuwait, it's actually went up. If you look at Oman, it's went down. If you look at Qatar, it went almost 50% from 29 to 14. If you look at Saudi Arabia, it went from 27 to 23%. UAE, it went from 14% to 13%. This is the actual uh, figures. So where do we go uh, from here? Uh, I think the only way for any country to achieve their visions or their strategies is by participation of all the stakeholders. If the stakeholders are not fully participating, there is no success on any strategies. They have to invest in the human resources, in non-oil sector, and keep the knowledge. Now, what's the price of you fail? Because always, if you do anything, there is a consequences of what you will do. There is a price for success, and there is a price for failure. I'm afraid we need to avoid the uh, political uh, decay, which is the theory's outcome leader must take into consideration the failure of the natural uh, strategies. Uh, Thank you for your listening. If you want to know more information about myself, you could see my website there. And if you want to know more about this topic that I want to talk, I mean, I did talk about it, you could uh, read my book. It's available in all the uh, international uh, outlook. Thank you. Well, Dr. Turkey, thank you very much for that presentation and, and walking us through. Um, the commenter for this session is Dr. Giath, and because I don't think his bio's in your programs, let me just very briefly say that he is certainly a subject matter expert on all things uh, Middle East, North Africa. He's a Fulbright scholar that draws upon 30 years of experience, both in uh, business and academia. Um, one really interesting note I find is that he introduced Islamic finance courses um, for the first time here in the United States, and in particular, the first graduate certificate in Islamic finance here in Washington, D.C. at American University. Uh, Dr. Giath, uh, you're welcome to speak either from your chair or from the podium and, and comment on the session topic today. Because I am tall, I have to. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Good morning. Actually, I have to start by stating that uh, we made a deal, Mac and I, because I am from Aleppo, Syria. I was born and raised and educated there. Thank you, Dr. Anthony, for the kind invitation uh, in the National Council. It is really uh, an honor and a pleasure to attend this uh, signature conference, which uh, I have been attending for years. Uh, and again, thank you for allowing me to welcome uh, students and faculty from American University in Washington, D.C. to attend this wonderful uh, conference. Actually, Mr. Mancino uh, suggested that I should focus on a couple of uh, proposals. So a couple of nights ago, I started with about 50. Then I was shocked when he told me that I can speak for only eight minutes. So 50, 40, 30, and then I settled on three. Uh, again, while, while I am an academician now, uh, I am going to wear my business hat. I had the honor and privilege uh, of living in the Gulf for about 20 years off and on and I was associated uh, with the Arab Fund for Economic and Social Development, uh, which is based in Kuwait, and uh, with the Kuwait Investment Authority, which is the oldest sovereign wealth fund in the world. I'm going to focus on a couple of proposals uh, dealing with the GCC and the United States government as well. In the sphere of uh, higher education, uh, I have students from the GCC countries studying at American University, 
specifically Kogad School of Business. By the way, it is the oldest business school in the nation's capital. I hope my dean is listening to me now. Uh, they come and they learn about their field of interest. In the meantime, they learn about our culture here, and then they go back. Unfortunately, American students that I teach at American University, uh, they have no clue about the GCC. Therefore, we introduced a, a exciting program by which we take students uh, focusing on a specific country and a specific issue. We give them lectures and so on, and then we end that by taking them to the Gulf, to that particular country. And I had the pleasure once, a couple of years ago, to take my students to Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and Doha. And guess what? Some of these students, they started to look for business opportunities and employment in the wonderful uh, GCC countries. The second, which I think it is very helpful to appreciate and understand that I will offer the proposal to American universities in the United States to create such programs because really when you combine academic work along with visit to the country, uh, that creates interest. The second point that I like to deal with, which is one of my passions for the last 30 years, and I uh, structure every year a conference dealing with Sovereign Wealth Fund, which is the first to the best of my knowledge, an academic institution dealing with the Sovereign Wealth Funds. Uh, last week, we had our sixth uh, conference, and next year in October, we will have our seventh. And we are always blessed by having Dr. Anthony as a keynote speaker uh, in these conferences. So just to uh, alert us about what do we mean by Sovereign Wealth Fund, because there are so many of them. Uh, the last count was about 116 of them. But a sovereign wealth fund, according to the IMF, is defined as a special purpose investment fund or arrangement owned by the general government. Sovereign wealth funds are commonly established out of balance of payments, surpluses, official foreign currency, and receipt resulting from commodity experts, end of quote from the IMF. The GCC, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, they own 33% of the general sovereign wealth fund in the world. It's about uh, the total number of the sovereign wealth fund in the world is about $7.6 trillion. The GCC owns 33% of that, and again, what is misunderstood in the world, we always talk about Norway as number one. That's not true. The UAE, because they have about four different sovereign wealth fund, the UAE owns $1.1 trillion worth of sovereign wealth funds. That's number two after China. Obviously, we have uh, Kuwait, 592 billion, Qatar, 328, and Saudi Arabia, 320, 320 billion. But mind you, we have been hearing about the 5% of Aramco, and consequently that will be equivalent to about $2 trillion. So we are waiting for that exciting announcement from Saudi Arabia, which will be great, great uh, uh, offer to the uh, sovereign wealth fund capabilities. So consequently, I will propose that uh, the GCC sovereign wealth funds consider joining forces in acquiring some assets that are in compliance with their asset management allocation and uh, focus like technology, infrastructure, and others in accordance with their plan. And what is interesting here is that when they combine efforts, not necessarily in all aspects, but when they go after a certain asset, combining their effort is going to provide uh, them with a highly competitive advantage in terms of acquiring these assets. And I don't have to tell you, but I hope, we all hope that the rift is going to be reconciled uh, soon 
because it is to the benefit of the US as well in terms of investment. Third and finally, uh, I am fascinated about Islamic finance, and I'll tell you frankly that the US, unfortunately, we are behind the UK, France, Luxembourg, in the area of alternative finance, which is Islamic finance. Esteemed guest, it is $2.6 trillion subsector. And it is growing at 15% per annum. And two basic features of Islamic finance. One, no interest. And His Royal Highness Prince Turkil Faisal yesterday reminded us uh, when he was talking about uh, the, US, the Saudi government offering loans to their citizens with no interest. And by the way, it is in the Quran. No riba, no interest. And the second aspect of Islamic finance, which is really common sense, it is based on profit loss sharing. So the two parties, they share profit and losses. Because in our conventional system, there is always one party who bear the risk, the borrower. And I'll tell you frankly, uh, when we talk about Islamic finance, most people don't know this, but our beautiful city center here in Washington, D.C., is financed through Islamic finance from a bank in the state of Qatar. Esteemed guest, Islamic finance is not for Muslims only. It is for humanity. It's for humanity. And I always argue about it because when people talk about Islamic finance, they will say, well, gee, in the United States we have less than three million people, Muslims, I say you are forgetting the actual fact that Islamic finance is for everybody. And here I am going to uh, just propose that in the US, especially in the US government, they need to have a closer look at Islamic finance. Because I'll tell you frankly, I talk with people, I lecture, I speak at conferences, Lots of people, they don't have a clue about Islamic finance. And we need to focus on that. Specifically, that we are having problems with infrastructure financing. I don't have to tell you how many bridges and roads in the United States are in desperate need of finance. And in Islamic finance, we developed something called, has been developed called sukuk. Some people translate that to Islamic bond, it is not bond, it is ownership. And consequently, again, lots of people don't understand or they don't hear about that here in the United States of America, the Office of the Controller of the Currency issued a Sharia compliant Ijara leasing, which is allowed in the United States, but unfortunately when I talk to our bankers from the Gulf, they say, oh, it takes a long time, and we want it fast, and what have you. And I have been, in the last year or so, working very hard with a couple of banks in the area to encourage them to come and establish the first Islamic finance operation in Washington, D.C. So I need your help and prayers for that. Again, as my distinguished chair, mentioned, uh, I took the initiative back in 2014 to offer the first Islamic finance course, followed by another course, which is dealing with Islamic banking and stock market and sukuk. And finally, with the help of God and American University Management, I managed to introduce the first graduate certificate in Islamic finance in the USA. We are very proud of that. And again, I can't do that without support from my dean and from my president. Esteemed guests, out of passion, I established my own American Center for Alternative Finance. It's called ACFAF. 
So before April 15, I need your contributions. And it is tax deductible. Uh, so these are my three recommendations. To conclude, one is dealing with education. We have to take the young students, American students, who are going to be the policy makers to visit the GCC and following the steps of Dr. Anthony. He has been doing that for years. Number two is the question of sovereign wealth fund. We have to pay attention to the sovereign wealth fund. It is very powerful and we have to use it for a good cause. Third is Islamic finance. And I'll be available for any questions. I have lots of small brochures that I carry with me every day, along with my business cards. Once again, Dr. Anthony and the National Council, thank you for the privilege and the honor of being with you today. And esteemed guests, thank you for listening. I'm not sure if I covered the seven, point, seven minutes or I still have a minute. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll do as before in order to allow the speakers to uh, add what they might have if they had another uh, half minute. Uh, but the questions again are educational in and of themselves. Um, and the speakers are free to combine them, overlap any, and ignore them or prioritize them or even comment on the relevance of a particular question. One, I'll, I'll read them all, then you choose which ones. How has, and uh, keep your uh, response to, uh, two minutes for, uh, for whatever that response may be. How has the diminishment of subsidy systems in GCC countries impacted regional economies? How does Islamic banking interact with global financing, financial and investment trends? How might a brain drain from the Arab region be decreased in nature and extent? How can Arab countries absorb excess educated talent? How have crises in Syria, Yemen, Iraq, and Libya impacted these issues? How can Arab governments incentivize the business community to mitigate abuse of migrant labor populations? How can the United States help Arab economies provide more conducive environments for entrepreneurs and small businesses, including accessibility of capital, eradication of bureaucratic obstacles, and business-friendly legislation, such as enhanced bankruptcy laws and systems? How can the United States and Arab states alleviate the strain of refugees on host countries, education, and health care sectors? How can the banking sector in some Arab countries be strengthened to enhance aiding in economic development? How would one assess the prospects of the successful implementation of the proposed Arab Customs Union? and the subsequent goal of establishing an Arab common market. How can the Arab region prioritize making investments that are sustainable? How can policymakers balance a focus on sustainability between formal laws and institutions and informal conceptions and models? Next to the last, how do free zones contribute to economic growth and reduced unemployment. How might one characterize the implications for Arab countries where such entities are minimal or non-existent? Given the GCC focus on economic diversification and expansion of alliances, especially on agriculture for self-sufficiency, partially, uh, where do you see a growing economic pat partnership at, at all between GCC and Latin America going, especially with Brazil being the largest exporter of halal meat 
and the Dubai Global Business Forum being held in Panama every year. Um, and with regard to Islamic finance, how might the, the 2008, late 2007, 2008, liquidity crisis, international housing, mortgage, financial crisis, have been affected one way or the other, better or worse, had uh, there been more Islamic uh, banking or predominant role for Islamic banking in the United States of America, which is blamed for having instigated that worldwide crisis more than any other country. Steve, you can call on whichever ones you want. Well, Dr. Anthony, uh, two minutes each. We'll host a question. So. Uh, well, basically turn to the panel and if, as Dr. Anthony said, uh, two minutes uh, to pick your question um, or two, but if you can keep it to a two minute re response. Uh, Mac, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, first of all, some of the countries, and, and you, I'm treating the United Arab Emirates as a country, even though it's seven individual states. Uh, the UAE is experimenting with a new FDI law, foreign direct investment law, that will allow up to 122 sectors foreign companies to come in and set up onshore without a local partner. Now that may seem counterintuitive given the fact that we want to build up the, the local population, but they've also instituted uh, the ICT fund that will help bring money to young entrepreneurs, particularly in the um, ICT fields. Uh, Khalifa University also has instituted 14 new research centers with 10 to 15 faculty each and are helping push uh, nationals into those research centers and three research institutes dealing with uh, uh, renewables, um, hydrocarbons, and uh, fourth platform technologies. They're also, they have a, a think tank, a real think tank there, to look at the future and decide what jobs will be needed and create the courses and programs now to educate the youth. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Very good, yeah. important point on education. Uh, Dr. Turkey, we'll go in the kind of order of the speaking. So the bevy of questions, uh, uh, please uh, choose your passion, and uh, if you can, for two minutes. There is a lot of questions here, so which one do you think I should pick? <laughs> You're the moderator. Um, maybe if you can uh, speak to the, uh, continuing the theme of economic diversification that you were talking about uh, in your presentation, okay. and I think several of the questions touched on that. So. Uh, mm -hmm. maybe kind of summarize your thoughts um, on that challenge and opportunity moving forward in two minutes. And your specialty, everybody knows, has a lot to do often with agriculture. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of questions pertaining to that. No one else has focused on that. Well, the one close to my heart, and that's the one I teach and I practice, which is the role of agriculture to enhance security, alleviate poverty, and promote economic growth. I do believe the best way for any country is to concentrate on agriculture, whether it is an industrial agriculture or social agriculture, to uh, alleviate poverty and promote economic growth, especially in the rural area. I would like to bring the attention that is in, uh, in 2016 or 2015, 152 countries have signed an agreement uh, on the 17 United Nations 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And every country has to make his own uh, visions that it has to be achieved by 2030. And the United Nations have developed some indexes to measure those kind of progress. Saudi Arabia and other countries have made their visions which is it will complement the master plan's visions of the United Nations 17 development goals. The G20s, which is it will take place in Saudi Arabia in November, and actually within this month, Saudi Arabia will be the president of the G20 uh, gathering on next November. Uh, diversifications of the economy. Uh, first, you have to define that is when a country is, uh, have the natural resources, a lot of people, they call it 
the uh, Dutch disease. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that terms, but relying on one source of income, that make it extremely difficult for any countries to get out of this disease and to go to diversify their economy. Their society, they want a lot of income and they don't want to do any work or hardly any. So then with that kind of attitude, how could you really get out of the subsidies? Because there is a limit. You reduce subsidies, you increase unrest. And you know, the Middle East is already, anybody want to talk about Saudi Arabia, you have to keep three in mind. Number one, it's the Qibla al Muslimin. There is one billion people five times a day, they go pray there. They put the direction of Mecca. Number two, it's the central banks of the oil in the world. And number three, we are in a very extreme, 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 extreme environment. The Arab world is 60% under the poverty line, 70% are youth, one million people every year they go into the job. We need to, let's put it this way, we know the crash is coming, but we don't know when, unless we really fix the problems in the Middle East. Sure, people like to talk to you about sectarian, talk to you about war, talk to you about Iran, talk to you about all these kind of external threat. They are not a threat, they are a challenge. The real threat is unemployment, corruptions, creating jobs, creating housing, creating food for their societies. Wow. Super. Uh, please join me in thanking all three.